still hasn't faded. I shoved my hand in his face. Still there? Yep. You don't have to sound so happy about it. I dipped around him, stopping. We had company. Cross, Will, and Boobs stood at the edge of the field. Will held a small cooler in his hand. We thought you guys could use some drinks since you missed the party. Seth fell into an easy banter with him while I fiddled with a string on my pants. Drinks consisted of cheap wine coolers that Caleb would have laughed at, but I was so thirsty I wasn't complaining. Once Seth shut up long enough to allow someone else to talk, Will began drilling me about the demon battles I'd taken part in. Cross watched on with a sort of hero-worship look on his face, which was so different from the ones sent my way in North Carolina. None of them here knew the whole story surrounding my rise to fame, or the crash and burn I'd taken on my way down. I wanted to keep it that way. I relaxed on the rock eventually, sipping my drink while I answered their questions. So how many times were you tagged? asked Cross, two wine coolers in hand. Will turned to his friend slowly. Dude, that's not a question you ask someone. You fail. I froze. Unintentionally, I had exposed my neck by flipping my hair back. Flushing, I tipped my head so my hair fell forward in a heavy curtain. Seth, who'd been in a deep conversation with boobs, probably about himself, pulled his head out of God's nowhere and twisted around to us. Cross grimaced. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. It's just that I think it's awesome that you fought demons and survived. Not that you were tagged, of course. That's not awesome. That's pretty messed up. Will rolled his eyes, groaning. Just shut up, Cross. No, it's okay. I cleared my throat, deciding if I didn't make a big deal about it, then none of them would. I don't know how many times. A couple, I guess. Cross looked relieved, but then Seth stood and Cross shifted further back. I watched him stride between us and stop, blocking both Cross and Will as he faced me. I had no idea what he was doing, but what came out of his mouth wasn't even on the possibility list. Dance with me. I stared up at him. What? Seth bowed gracefully, extending one arm to me. Dance with me, please. Why do you want to dance in the middle of a field, Seth? Why not? He wiggled his fingers. Dance with me, pretty please. With sugar on top, Will added, chuckling. Seth's grin grew to epic proportions. Dance with me, Alexandria. Over his shoulder, I spotted boobs eyeing the whole thing with a pouty, displeased look. I don't know if that made me take Seth's hand or the fact he was embarrassing the hell out of me. Seth yanked me to my feet, keeping my one arm outstretched while placing my other around his back. Then he started waltzing around the field with no music. It was so ridiculous that I had to laugh. We rounded a boulder, tripping over the uneven ground. Seth knew how to dance, really dance, like the kind people did in ballrooms. With one arm, he spun me out from him. I giggled. Did you pick this up from watching Dancing with the Stars? You mock me. Seth spun me so my back was against his chest. You wound my sensibilities when I'm trying to help you. Help me with what? Seth twirled me around. You need to know how to dance without a pole if you're going to the ball. I smacked him on the chest. I don't dance like a stripper, and I'm not going to that stupid ball. He didn't respond. Grinning, he slipped his hand up my back and dipped me over his arm. I laughed and let my head fall back. I could see boobs on her rock. Very slowly, when she was sure she had Seth's attention, in that nanosecond he had me bend backward, she licked her lips. Seth dropped me. Much later, after the sun had fallen and we were covered in mud, Seth and I slipped past the dining hall. Trying not to bring attention to ourselves, we moved as quietly as possible. I rubbed my aching rear and caught Seth watching me. Your fault, I whispered. You're never going to let me forget that, are you? You dropped me on my butt. He tipped his head back, laughing softly. I blame the wine coolers. I blame boobs. Grinning madly, Seth grabbed my hand and hurried me down the hall. 
We passed several quiet rooms, and then we heard Marcus, loud and clear. I have no idea if Lucian is planning anything. We stopped and looked at each other. Are you not close with him? I heard Tully ask. Lucian keeps a lot secret, just like every one of you does, Marcus responded angrily. Seth pulled me under the stoop beside the room Marcus and Tully occupied, pressing me against the wall. He didn't have to get that close. Come on, Seth, back. Shh. He tipped his head toward mine, strands of his hair swept against my cheeks. This feels naughty. I shot him a dirty look. I know he's up to something, said Tully. He thinks he can control him, but he's foolish for believing so. Seth straightened an inch, a slight frown pulling at his lips. Even Lucian is not that foolish, Marcus responded. Tally made a disgusted sound. It is my job as a minister to protect them, my duty, if you know something. I know nothing of the sort. Marcus slapped something down. You're being paranoid, minister. You call it being paranoid, and I call it planning for the future. There are certain precautions we could take, just in case. Ways to ensure that they are never threatened. I wondered what they were talking about. Seth also had a puzzled look on his face, which almost made me giggle. Maybe the wine coolers were still in my system. He must have felt a laugh bubbling up in me because he looked down at me and smiled. What are you suggesting, Minister? There are ways of eliminating the threat, ways in which no one is harmed. Some of the council members agree that it may be best to do so. When Marcus spoke next, his words were cold and flat. Has the council already acted on this? Tally scoffed. What are you insinuating, Marcus? There was a stretch of silence. And how would you eliminate the threat, pray tell? The tension that followed Marcus's question was so thick I could feel it. We already have one here, replied Tally. Why not keep them both here? There was a stretch of silence. That is out of the question. I am sorry, but I cannot agree to that. Perhaps you just need some time and motivation. You want that council seat very badly. I could make it happen. Seth dropped his head, his breath warm against my neck. I tried to move back, but there wasn't anywhere to go. Do you know what they're talking about? He whispered. For a second, I had to think about what he was asking. I felt kind of out of it. No clue. I do not believe my mind will change, Marcus finally responded. It is late, Minister, and this conversation is over. Seth's lips brushed against my neck, right under my ear. I jerked from the unexpected touch and then socked him in the stomach. He chuckled softly. Telly laughed mirthlessly. My offer stands until the end of sessions. Good evening, Minister Telly. We ducked into the adjoining room, shutting the door just in time. Telly exited seconds later, followed by Marcus. Seth and I stared at each other. There was something in his eyes, mischief definitely, but something else. He prowled toward me, grinning. I put my hand up, flattening it against his chest. My pulse sped up. Playtime is over, Seth. He placed his hand over mine. Sounds like a bit of bribery going on. That doesn't surprise me. I gave the room a brief glance. We were in another sitting room. How many of these things were there? I'm a little surprised over how much Marcus dislikes Tally. Shrugging, Seth went to the door and peered out. All clear. He paused, grinning over his shoulder. Unless you want to stay here a little while. That couch looks comfy. I shoved past him. Can't you think of anything else? He followed me out. No, not really. Wow, you're so multidimensional, Seth. Chuckling, he sidled up to my side and dropped his arm over my shoulders. And you're such a killjoy. Chapter 20 Over the next couple of days, Seth consumed most of my time. I saw very little of Aiden and Marcus. Once, when Seth wasn't attached to my hip, I hung out with Lawden while she got a Manny and Petty for the ball. I opted out of the indulgence. People touching my feet creeped me out. 
Seth and I had snuck into one of the training classrooms between practices and sparred with some of the halves the other day. I think we caused more mayhem than anything else, but I'd enjoyed fighting people other than Seth. Goofing off eased some of the pent-up frustration of being in this place, and the growing unease that occupied each day closer to my council session. But time with Seth hadn't been all fun and games. We'd spent most of our training sessions working on avoiding the use of elements in battle. Throwing balls of flame around really wasn't an indoor sport, so we were forced outside. We also argued. A lot. He got pissy because he claimed I'd been watching Aiden when he'd shown up one day during our practice and worked out alongside us. Seth also claimed that I'd drooled on myself. Not true. Flushing with embarrassment and anger, I'd stormed off and left him standing in the middle of the field we'd practiced in. A short hour later, Seth reappeared with hamburgers and fries, my favorite, and I kind of forgave him. He'd had hamburgers, what else could I have done? I still had no recollection of how I'd ended up in the maze. Not knowing what had happened or why a pure would do that nagged at me. So did the conversation we'd overheard between Marcus and Lucian. I couldn't shake the feeling that those two events were connected. But that could just be my paranoia. Today's practice had been cut short as Seth had something important to discuss with Lucian. When I'd asked what it was, he told me not to worry my pretty little butt over it and to go hang out with Lawton. I hate boys. And I couldn't find Lawton anywhere. Even though it irked me that no one wanted me to roam around alone, I didn't want to end up a pure's compulsion toy again. Thinking about that filled me with enough anger I could have put my fist through the wall. After checking out a million sitting rooms, I gave up on my search for Lawton. Another long and boring evening staring at the white walls in my room awaited me. With barely restrained aggravation, I turned the corner and froze. Up ahead, a female servant trembled on her knees. She dropped a stack of dishes on the carpet. The man towering over her wore the unmistakable and terrifying garb of a master. I'd only seen one once before, and that had been when Mom had brought me before the council when I was seven. I'd never forget the blood-red tunic or how they shaved their heads and all facial hair. The master kicked one of the empty plates, shattering it. You careless, stupid half-blood. Is carrying plates too complicated for you? She cowered, lowering her head and clasping her knees. She didn't speak, but I could hear her soft cries. Get up. Disgust dripped from the master's voice. The girl didn't move quickly enough for his liking. He reached down and grabbed a handful of her tangled hair, yanking her to her fate. Her gasp of surprise and pain brought forth a cruel laugh from the master and something far worse. He lifted his free hand to hit her. I didn't even think. Rage propelled me into action. I struck out, catching the master's fist before it landed a blow. The master whirled around. Lack of eyebrows gave his startled expression an almost comical aspect. He recovered quickly and tried to pull his hand free. I held on. Didn't your mother ever teach you not to hit a lady? Anger and contempt filled his eyes, sharpening them. You dare to touch me and interfere in a situation that does not concern you? Do you have a desire for the elixir, half-blood? I smiled, tightening my grip until I felt the bones in his hand rub together. His lips thinned in pain, filling me with sick satisfaction. Oh, I'm not just a half-blood. I know what you are. He wrenched his hand free, lips curling with disgust. You think that will save you? If anything, that ensures that one day you'll be under the master's control, or worse. His words should have scared me, but they just pissed me off. Go screw yourself, you eyebrowless freak. The master laughed as he twisted back to the silent girl but then he swung around so fast I hadn't a chance to raise my hands in defense. The fist intended for the servant ended up smashing right into my jaw. Fierce pain exploded along my face as I stumbled back into the wall. My eyes immediately filled with tears. The throbbing sent darts of dizziness through me. I held my jaw, almost certain he'd broken it. And then Seth was standing in front of me, a towering inferno of fury. I don't even know where he'd come from, or how he'd gotten there so quickly. That'll be the last thing you do, Seth snarled. He threw back his hand. 
not to hit the pure, but to kill the pure. Many times in practice I'd seen Akasha start to build in his hand, but always as just a small ball of energy. When he'd taken down Cain, Aiden had blocked most of it, but now it was all that I could see. The blue energy shot from somewhere under the sleeve of his shirt, filling his hand, crackling and snapping blue fire. Pain forgotten, I pushed off the wall and grabbed Seth's other arm. No, no! Get back, Alex, now. I got in front of him, blocking the master. The mark of the Apollyon stood out in contrast against his pale face. You can't do this, Seth. You need to calm down. Do it, urged the master. Seal your fate, Apollyon, as your bitch's fate has been sealed. Seth's eyes glowed, his lips pulled back in a snarl. Akasha spread, spitting flames. Ignore him, I balled my hands in the front of his shirt. Please, you can't do this. This wasn't working, he wasn't listening to me. His arm went back, readying to release the most powerful element known to man. I twisted around. Get out of here, now! The servant took off, but the master stayed, daring Seth with his smile, as if he had no sense of self-preservation. Then it struck me. He wanted Seth to do this, knowing that for half to kill a pure in any situation meant death. Possible even for the Apollyon. I turned back to Seth, hands trembling. I pressed against his chest as if I could somehow burrow my way into him and make him understand that the penalty for hitting me wasn't capital punishment. I could taste the fear in the back of my throat. Panic overshadowed the physical pain. Seth shuddered, and then his arms swept around me. I almost cried out in relief. The master's cruel laugh echoed around us, seeming to hang in the air long after he left the hallway. He stared down at me, still furious. I want to kill him. I know, I whispered, blinking back tears. No, you don't. I still do. But you can't. It was my fault. He was about to hit a servant, and I stopped him. He... Your fault, he said, eyes widening with disbelief now. He reached out and caught my chin, turning my head to the side. No, this wasn't your fault. I swallowed, closing my eyes. Crisis averted, for now. Is it going to bruise? Most definitely. I think I'm going to be in trouble. I stepped back, staring at the floor. This Seth, this hard and lethal Seth, was frightening. You're going to be in trouble, too? Yes. Seth sounded as if he didn't give a crap about that. I touched the left side of my face and winced. Oh, crap. Seth pulled my hand away from my face. I think if we make it to dinner without anyone saying anything, then we're in the clear. You think so? Seth smiled, but everything about him still seemed on the verge of destroying something. Yes. We didn't make it until dinner. About twenty minutes later, Marcus and crew stormed the sitting room Seth and I were kind of hiding in. Aiden was with them, his eyes immediately finding me. His gaze glided over my face, stopping on what I knew was a nasty-looking bruise. He came to a complete stop and inhaled sharply. Potent anger rolled off him in waves, nearly as overwhelming as what was still radiating from the one next to me. What were you thinking, Alexandria? demanded Marcus. I pulled my eyes from Aiden's, but didn't look at Marcus. I watched Seth instead. His face was still a picture of hard lines and chilling beauty. I know I shouldn't have stopped the master, but he was going to beat a girl for dropping plates. I had to do... The door swung open, revealing Minister Tully and a slew of council guards. I stiffened, but Seth stood. What is this? he demanded, hands bawling into fists. What is this? Minister Tully repeated, striding across the room, tall and graceful, his green robes flowing. He stopped before Marcus and Lucian. What is it that I hear about Alexandria attacking a master this afternoon? Attacked, I sputtered. I didn't attack anyone. I stopped. She did interfere with a master, but she did not attack the man, Marcus cut in, sending me a dangerous lock. However, he did strike Alexandria. Tully spared me a brief glance. 
Half-bloods known to not interfere with a master in their treatment of servants. To do so is a breach of the breed order. My mouth dropped open. Had I expected to be in trouble? Yes, but not to be accused of breaking the order. Are you serious? Seth stepped forward, eyes narrowing into thin slats. Get your Apollyon under control this instant, Lucian, Tally spat, or my guards will. Lucian swung toward Seth, but I knew there was nothing that he could say or do. I grabbed Seth's arm and tugged hard. Sit, I whispered. He glanced over his shoulder at me, brows raised. I'd rather stunned. Gods, he so wasn't helping matters. Not like it would stop him, but I held onto his arm. Minister Tully, I understand that Alexandria should not have interfered, but accusing her of breaking the law. Marcus shook his head. Oh, I think that's a bit extreme. Not half-blood is extreme, Tully responded. Neither of you have any control over her. She's threatening monsters now. What will she do as a Napoleon? Massacre them in their sleep? I laughed. Everyone looked at me. I'm sorry, but this is ridiculous. All I did was stop him from hitting a girl. That's it. I didn't hit him, but he did hit me. I pointed at my jaw. And I wouldn't massacre people in their sleep. Tally turned, facing me fully. You, little girl, have shown no regard for the law or for rules from the moment you could breathe. Oh, yes, I've seen your files. Had everyone seen my files? Gah, I felt exposed. You are uncontrollable and a constant problem for the Council, Tully continued, turning back to Lucian. She belongs here, where the Council can control her, since neither of you have been able to ingrain a sense of respect in the girl. Fear stopped me dead in my tracks. What? That will not happen, Seth said, so low that I wasn't sure anyone else heard him. But then everyone in the room froze. Are you threatening me, Apollyon? Threatening the Council? Tully demanded. I'd swear he sounded happy about this, but that would be crazy because Seth would kill him. Seth would wipe the ground with Tully's face. I tore my gaze from the head minister and saw the marks of the Apollyon swirling across Seth's face. And then I realized Aiden had moved, standing on the other side of me. I thanked the gods that everyone was focused on Seth, fearing he was about to lose it. The look on Aiden's face said he was about to rip through everyone in this room. My heart sank as I looked between the two guys. This wasn't going to end well at all. I stood, my knees shaking. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. You did nothing wrong, Seth hissed. But I did. I shouldn't have interfered. I met Tally's eyes and swallowed my pride at the same time. I forgot. I forgot my place. Seth whirled on me so quickly, I thought he might actually zap me. I met his furious stare, willing him to just sit down and shut up. Minister, as you can see, Alexandria sees her error. Lucian moved in front of Seth, his hands clasped together. She is strong-willed, stubborn even, but she broke no law today. As you know, if she had attacked the master, I doubt he'd be well enough to spread such atrocious exaggerations. She thinks without acting sometimes, Marcus joined in. She is reckless, but she never has ill intentions. As for controlling her, I can promise you that she won't even speak out of turn for her stay here. I opened my mouth, but shut it. Tally drew another breath before turning to Lucian. This kind of behavior she has repeatedly displayed is concerning not only to me, but the Council. Not that is something you are already aware of, Lucian. He paused, scanning the room. His gaze, full of condemnation, fell on me. I will not forget this. With that, he turned and stalked from the realm. The guards followed him, stiff and silent. I collapsed on the couch, exhausted. I'd barely escaped the noose with that one. I felt Seth sit back down, but I didn't look at him. Alexandria, what have I told you time and time again? asked Marcus. Enough, Lucian said. It is in the past now. It is done. It just happened, Marcus retorted, and this one here threatened the master with a kasha for crying out loud. He is lucky that the master didn't report him. What did you expect? Lucian countered wearily. He will defend what is his. I sent my stepfather a death glare. 
I am not his. Would you please stop referring to me as a possession instead of a person? Lucian smiled. Either way, Seth cannot be blamed for defending her. Or would you rather he'd allowed the master to continue to beat Alexandria? That is preposterous, Lucian. Marcus's hands balled into fists. They went back and forth for a little while. Eventually, my head ached as badly as my jaw did. On the positive side, Seth began to relax and no longer looked like he wanted to wipe out an entire village of pures. Once I'd gathered I wasn't in that much trouble, I slipped out the double doors and breathed in the brisk air. I didn't roam off too far, staying just around the corner from the sitting room. I kept thinking about what the master had said. My fate had already been sealed. Had the master known something, or had he just been taunting Seth? Alex. I turned to the sound of Aiden's voice. His eyes were flinty silver. Hey, I murmured. I know I messed up again, and... I'm not here to yell at you, Alex. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Oh, sorry. I'm just used to everyone yelling at me. He tipped his head to the side, eyes a dark gray. I understand why you did what you did. Honestly, I wouldn't have expected you to do anything differently. Really? I looked around skeptically. Are you on drugs? Aiden smiled, but then his eyes flickered to my jaw. The smile faded. Does it hurt? No, I lied. He looked like he knew better. Before I knew what he was doing, he reached out and brushed his fingers around the edge of the bruise. It's swelling. Have you put ice on it? I had, actually, but I'd grown bored holding the ice bag Seth had rifled together. Staring at Aiden now, though, I completely forgot what he just asked me. His fingers were still against my cheek, and that was the only thing in this world that mattered. You still show so much strength. A small smile appeared on his lips. Then he dropped his hand, the heady connection brief. No other half-blood would have done what you did. I don't know why you keep saying that. I leaned against the smooth wall, as if it could somehow ground me back into reality. It's the truth, Alex, and I'm not even talking about what you did for the half-blood. It's what you just did in there. I know damn well what it took for you to apologize and say what you did. That took strength. It wasn't strength. I was scared out of my mind, actually. Maybe a little irrational, you know? Aiden glanced away toward the labyrinth. From here, all I could see were the tips of the vine-covered statues. I was wrong. My breath caught in my throat. Wrong about what? He turned back to me, eyes silvery. About a lot of things, but I always thought your irrational nature was a flaw. It's not. It's what makes you so strong. I stared at him, my heart doing all kinds of crazy things in my chest. Thank you. Don't think. I know. I smiled, even though it made my jaw hurt. Don't thank you for that, but I did. Aiden nodded. I better get back in there. Don't wander off too far, okay? I nodded and watched him turn around. He got to the French doors and stopped. Turning around, the expression on his face was unreadable, but his words were precise. Part of me wishes Seth had killed that master for touching you. Dinner was served early on the night of the ball, and the mad bustle of servants drove me up to my room. My nerves were stretched tight from my impending court session, my run-in with a master's fist, Seth's psycho Akasha killing power, and Aiden's parting words. Part of me wishes Seth had killed that master for touching you. Two days later, and I still couldn't forget what he'd said. That had been a serious statement, but what could it mean? Did it matter? No, I told myself. Even if Aiden loved me as much as I loved Cake, it didn't matter. There was no future there, only death and despair. A soft knock on the door pulled me out of my thoughts. Since Seth never knocked, I knew it couldn't be him. I scooted off the bed and went to the door. Lawden stood in the hallway, dressed in a beautiful deep green dress that clung to her hips before billowing out around her in soft, wispy material. Her hair was done up in an intricate twist, adorned by several fresh rose blossoms. I glanced down at my sweats and shirt. Gods, I never felt more boring and ugly in my entire life. 
and here I thought Leah was the only one who could evoke such feelings. Lawdon smiled faintly. If you're not busy, which I can tell you're not, I want to show you something. I glanced back at my bed and shrugged. It wasn't like I had anything to do. We passed several servants on the way to her room on the floor above, and Lawdon smiled at each of them graciously. Once inside her room, she circled one arm around my shoulders and steered me to an overstuffed chair by her closet. I sat down and pulled my legs up to my chest. You wanted to show me your closet door? Lawdon's laugh was throaty and infectious. I found myself smiling at her. You are so much like your mother. She shook her head as she leaned against the doors. The things you say, it's like hearing Rachel speak. My smile faded a bit, and I wrapped my arms around my knees. My mom never said half of the stupid stuff that comes out of my mouth. You'd be surprised. She paused as a soulful look crept across her features. Do you know what your mother loved most about the council sessions? No. Lawden spun around and threw open her closet doors. She stepped back and spread her arms in a sweeping gesture. All the dancing and beautiful dresses. Curious, I leaned forward to get a look inside the closet and nearly fell out of the chair. Wow, that's a lot of clothes. She gave a saucy grin over her shoulder. A girl can never have too many clothes. Come on, take a look. I pulled myself from the chair. The gowns caught my eye like being under a compulsion that had turned me into a girly girl in under two seconds flat, I stepped forward and ran a hand over the soft material. You like them? She tugged on a deep purple dress in crushed velvet. My fingers lingered on a red silk dress. I couldn't see the cut of it, but the color was divine. These are the kind of dresses you'd give up your firstborn child for. She laughed, dropping the purple dress and gently unhooking the red one. She held it up between us. Why are you so dead set against going to the ball? I shrugged, eyeing the sleeveless dress. It had scalloped edging around the bodice, a high waist, and a skirt cut to cling to the legs. I don't even know why I'd be invited since halves aren't. But you are different. She hung the dress in the closet door and smoothed out the silk. Being a Napoleon sets you apart from the rest of your kind, Alex. Once you awaken, I have been told that both you and Seth will even be able to attend council sessions. I hadn't known that, but I seriously doubted at eighteen I'd needed to be in that kind of position of power. Maturity didn't happen overnight. My eyes and mind were fastened on that dress. There's not going to be anyone there I know, and no offense, but my idea of fun isn't spending a night with a bunch of pures. None taken. Lawton pulled out the skirt. The hue of the red caught the light, casting a faint glimmer over the dress. Seth will be there, so will Aiden. I looked at her sharply. Why would I care if Aiden will be there? He's a pure. Where else would he be tonight? Lawton smiled faintly. Would you like to try it on? No, thank you. Humor me, why don't you? Your mom wore a dress like this once, and I only have a little while before I'm due downstairs. The yearning to try the dress on was a physical ache, but I shook my head. Lawden persisted until I found myself standing in front of a full-length mirror with a red silk dress on. She stood behind me, hands on my shoulders. You look beautiful. The dress was stunning. It was made to fit me, or at least altered to do so. The silk hugged from my chest to my hips before gliding out around my thighs. I twisted to the side, grinning. The back looks just as good as the front. Red was definitely my color. For a moment, I let myself drift into a dream, where Aiden actually saw me in something this elegant and sexy. And what if Seth saw me in this? Even my dirtiest imagination couldn't capture his response accurately. I should probably take this off before I ruin it. Lawden pulled me away from the mirror and sat me down in front of a small table full of makeup and other suspicious-looking things. I started to stand, but she planted her hands on my shoulders again. Alex, there is no reason for you to stay in your room tonight while everyone else is enjoying the ball. So be still and let me do something with this hair of yours. I don't want to go. I twisted around so I faced her. She turned me back around and picked up a brush. Why? Is it because you have your session tomorrow? Wouldn't that be even more of a reason to relax and enjoy tonight? 
I frowned and tried to ignore the soothing way the brush moved through the tangles in my hair. It's not because of the session tomorrow. I just don't want to go. Ignoring me, she picked up a curling iron and started twisting long sections of hair around the barrel. I gave in to the primping pretty quickly, still having no real intention of going to the ball. It was nice to have someone make me pretty, even if all the hard work would be wasted on my pillow. Chattering on about my mother, she moved on to the makeup, and when she was done, I barely recognized the smoky-eyed girl staring back at me. Lauden had outdone herself. She'd piled the curls atop of my head, but pulled several thick strands down to cover my neck and tease the bodice of the dress. The curls seemed strategically placed as they hid the scars. What do you think? she asked, a powder brush in her hand. I had no idea what to say. The blush accented my cheekbones, making them appear higher than normal. She'd covered the bruise of my jaw without coating my face with makeup. The mascara and artfully applied shadow turned my eyes into the warmest chocolate instead of the dirt color they usually favored. Red stain plumped my lips in a way that begged to be kissed. Wow, my nose looks small. Lawden laughed, setting the brush down. Wait, the only thing you're missing is... Drifting off to a dresser and opening a large velvet box, she rooted around for a few moments and pulled out a silver chain with black stones surrounding a ruby. The necklace probably was worth more than my life, but she dropped it around my neck and clasped it. There, now you'll be the belle of the ball. I stared at myself, wanting a picture of this moment. I don't think I'd ever look so unlike me again. If Caleb could have seen this, I think he might have complimented me. Lawden glanced at a clock gilded in gold. And we're finished just in time. The ball has only just begun, and you will make a fashionably late entrance. My gaze drifted down the mirror. I can't go. You're being silly. You're going to look more beautiful than any pure blood in that room, Alex. You'll belong. I stood, shaking my head. You don't understand, Lawden. I do appreciate all of this, and it was fun, but I... I can't go. She frowned. Perhaps I don't understand. Would you explain it to me? Slowly, I turned back to the mirror. The girl staring back at me looked beautiful, if no one looked too hard or too close. If anyone did, the picture of perfection would start to fall apart. There wasn't a pretty dress in Lawden's closet that could fix that. Alex? Look at me, I said quietly. You don't see them. I can't go down there and have everyone stare at me. Lawden's concerned face appeared above my head in the mirror. Honey, everyone will be staring at you because you look beautiful. Everyone will be staring at my scars. She blinked and took a step back. No, they're not even. I know they will be. I turned around, fingering the delicate chain around my neck. Because it's what I notice first on someone. And look at my arms. They're pretty gross. And they were. The skin had never quite returned to the original skin tone. They'd paled like all demon tags did, but the tiny teeth marks left behind were uneven and red, lining my forearms, starting right above my wrist and ending along the tender skin of the inside of my elbow. The skin was just as uneven and patchy as my neck, but at least the scars on my throat had faded into a shiny color a shade or two lighter than my normal complexion. The bit of cleavage the dress showed off took away from those scars, but my arms totally made up for it. Lawden suddenly smiled, which I found really inappropriate considering she should be commiserating about how much of a freak I looked. She moved to her closet and pulled a large box off the top shelf. Taking it to her bed, her smile grew wider. I have the perfect thing. Doubtful, but I followed her to the bed. She flipped up the lid and pulled out two elbow-length gloves in black silk. Problem solved. I took the gloves gingerly. I'm going to look like Rogue from X-Men. Her nose wrinkled. Who? It doesn't matter. Try them on. The gloves will work now. If it were the summer, it would be a tad bit questionable. I slid one on, and it did cover the scars quite nicely. But gloves? For real? Who wore them but old grannies? I don't know about this. Lawden sighed, shaking her head. This is a formal ball, Alex. Have you been to one before? Um, no. 
Trust me when I say that you will not be the only girl wearing gloves. Now come on, we don't have much more time to stand up here and feel sorry for ourselves. You look beautiful, Alex, more so than even your mother ever did. I wiggled my fingers in the silk gloves, feeling excitement bubble for the first time. Half-bloods didn't go to grand balls, and they didn't have pure fairy godmothers either. So I'd never really expected to attend anything like this, especially not in this killer dress. But here I was. A slow smile crept over my face. Laden? Yes, she stopped at the door. Thank you. Her hand flew to her heart. Honey, you don't have to thank me. I'm just glad I could do this for you. You had this planned ever since Lucian mentioned something at breakfast, didn't you? That's why this dress fits so well. Lawden gave a sly smile. Well, I always thought red would be your best color. The ball was in full swing by the time Lawden and I made it downstairs. The soft hum of an orchestra filled the corridors as we moved closer to the ballroom. A display of dazzling candles lit the way. My excitement quickly turned into nerves. I've never worn anything like this before, and attending something like this just went against everything a half-blood knew. Also, orchestra music just wasn't my thing. Would I be expected to waltz? The last time, and only time, had been with Seth, and he dropped me. I couldn't hit the ground in this kind of dress. That would be a sacrilege. And who would even dance with me? Was I going to be hugging the wall all night? That's when I started sweating. Laudan grasped my hand with hers and led me forward. You fought demons and the idea of a ball scares you. Yes, I whispered. She laughed, the sound reminding me of wind chimes. You're going to do beautifully. Just remember that you belong among them, more so than any of them can even realize. I looked at her warily. You really do love some half-bloods, don't you? Her cheeks flushed a fierce red. I, I just believe that all of us are equal and should be treated that way. I doubted that was the main reason, but I didn't push it. She pulled me out of the soft shadows of the hallway, past the frozen furies, and right into the ballroom. I think I may have had a minor heart attack standing there, taking it all in. The room was massive, the walls entirely made of glass. Crystal vases full of roses sat in every corner and on every table, and flower-covered vines hung from sparkling chandeliers in a dazzling display of light and darkness and streamed across the ceiling. At the far end of the room a small orchestra sat, mortal musicians. Mortals were easy for both pures and halves to pick out. It was more than just the physical attributes that set them apart. Their movements were jerky and slow, while the pures glided gracefully around them. Compared to the pures, their expressions were bland. They were probably under compulsion to play here and not acknowledge anything weird. Pures could get a little freaky after a few drinks. Behind the orchestra, Thanatos rose above the mortals to loom over them like some kind of angel of death. His wingspan had to be at least eight feet, and the ever-present sad expression had been carved into the marble. Someone had laid a wreath of roses on the god's head. Nice touch. Two servants appeared in front of us. One held a tray of champagne flutes, and the other carried a platter of finger sandwiches and what smelled like raw fish. I had a sudden mad desire for tater tots. Laudan graciously accepted two glasses of champagne and handed me one. She caught my hand before I could down the glass. Careful, she warned softly. This isn't like mortal champagne. It's much stronger. I stared down at the bubbling liquid. How much stronger? She tipped her head to a table where a pure girl laughed hysterically while her companions looked on in annoyance. She had a glass of champagne in her hand. That's probably her second. You sip this champagne. Advice taken. Lucian drifted out of the throng of pures and grasped my free hand. His eyes drifted over me in a mixture of shock and appraisal. Laud, and you have outdone yourself. She looks just like Rachel did when she attended this very ball. It was official. I felt creeped out on a whole new level. And you can't even see her scars, Lucian continued. There was a weird sheen to his eyes, and I wondered if he was drunk. Utterly amazing job, Lawden.
Straining back, I tried to maintain a polite smile. Ah, uh, thanks. Lawton looked as put off as I felt. Smoothly, she engaged Lucian's interest. I scanned the room for friendly faces as my fingers clutched the fragile stem of the glass. Everyone, all the pures, looked magnificent in their finery. Most of the females wore the kind of risque dresses I'd love to, showing off expanses of perfectly smooth skin and long, graceful necks. I didn't belong here. No matter what Lawden said, I didn't belong here. Taking a deep breath, my gaze skittered over the crowd. Out of them, I recognized Minister Diana Elders. She wore a white, diaphanous gown that reminded me of something a goddess would wear. Beside her, my uncle looked extremely interested in whatever she was saying. In awe, I watched as he actually smiled, and when they turned toward us, those emerald eyes shone like jewels. That is, until he saw me. Marcus stepped back, blinking. Shock splashed across his face. He reacted like he'd seen a ghost. Recovering slowly, he and Minister Elders approached us. He nodded at Lucian and Lawton. Alexandria, you decided to join us, after all. Uncomfortable, I nodded and sipped my champagne. Diana smiled warmly enough, but she looked nervous when she addressed me. Miss Andros, it is a pleasure to meet you. Same here, I murmured dumbly. I was never good at exchanging pleasantries, but the good thing was that the pures surrounding me gravitated toward each other, and I was able to drift off to the side. I continued searching the crowd, well, for Aiden, if I was being honest with myself. I knew he wouldn't speak to me, but I wanted him to see me. Lame, yes, but I wanted that. Go figure it was Seth I saw first. Or he saw me first, I'm not sure. Either way, I was surprised to find both Aiden and Seth standing with another pure blood male I didn't recognize. Several pretty pures had crowded them, possibly fascinated by the fact that a Napoleon half-blood was in the mix, or they'd just been drawn to the general hotness of the group. Don Samos was one of those pretty pures. Her dress was a white sheath that ended above her knees. She stood the closest to Aiden, her slender tan arm brushing his as she spoke. I hadn't seen her since the first day of sessions, and I'd forgotten about her, but there she was. Seth stood facing Aiden in the entrance. He wore tux like the rest of the pures, except he'd managed to find an all-white one and still look good in it. A grin pulled at my lips. Like Seth needed any extra help sticking out. His gaze moved around the edge of the ballroom and landed on me. The expression on his face was almost comical. His brows inched up his forehead, eyes widened with surprise. Apparently, I looked like a doofus most of the time. Me being in a dress must be a sight to behold. A smug quirk to his lips was quick to replace the startled expression. He nodded at me approvingly. I tipped my glass at Zaff. He must have said something because Aiden's muscles stiffened under his black tux. Then, slowly, almost reluctantly, Aiden looked over his shoulder. The moment our eyes met, I felt like Cinderella. Aiden's lips parted as his gaze drifted over me in a way that made the glass tremble between my fingers. When his eyes made their slow journey back to mine, all the air fled my lungs. The silver burned so fiercely, so hot, that a warm blush swept over my skin. My hand fell to the side, the barely touched glass of champagne forgotten as it hung from my fingertips. Aiden turned around fully, his chest rising and falling sharply. He didn't smile. He seemed only capable of staring. Just like me, because he looked truly magnificent in the sharp cut of the black tux, the wild waves of hair tumbling over his forehead, and the soft lips still parted in surprise, eyes still full of hunger. As if in a daze, Aiden crossed the ballroom floor, his piercing eyes fastened on me. I knew I looked good, but not that good. Not so good that everyone else seemed to fade and disappear to Aiden. I thought of what he'd said, outside the sitting room, how he'd been wrong about a lot of things. I think I knew one of those things he'd been wrong about. So caught up in Aiden, I hadn't realized Seth had moved, but I felt him before he placed his hand on me, his fingers curving over my bare shoulder. Anger flashed over Aiden's face. 
he stalled, silver eyes dropping to my shoulder. I could almost feel it in the air, the primal jealousy, his raw urge to physically remove Seth's hand. Seth leaned close, his warm breath stirring the hair at the nape of my neck. People are starting to stare. Were they? I couldn't say I really cared, which was wrong, but Aiden was staring at me, staring at me with so much passion, so much want. It was the only thing I could think about. And then Aiden pulled it together. Halting mid-step, he clamped his jaw shut. Those eyes were still like quicksilver, smoldering in the soft light. His gaze drifted over me once more. Shivering under its intensity, I imagined that he was filing the image of me away. Seth's hand slid down my arm, fingers tightening around mine. You know he's not for you. I know, I whispered. And I did know that, and maybe that was why I felt so hollow inside. Aiden turned away then, smiling at something Don said. But it was a fake smile. I knew Aiden's smiles. After all, I lived for them. Do you want to dance? Seth suggested. Coming to the ball had been a bad idea. The emptiness I felt spread, leaving a gaping hole. I didn't belong here, but Aiden did. Aiden belonged here with pures like Dawn. Not with me, not a half-blood. I tore my gaze from Aiden and looked up at Seth. I don't want to dance. Seth's amber gaze drifted over me. Do you want to stay here? I don't know. He smiled and leaned forward. When he spoke, his lips brushed my ear. We don't belong here, Alex. Not with them. I wanted to ask exactly where it was we belonged, but I knew what Seth's answer would be. He'd say that we belonged together. Not in the way I wanted to belong to Aiden, but in a different way. A way I hadn't figured out yet. Let's go, he coaxed softly. I could stay here and continue pretending that I belonged, or I could leave with Seth. And then what? My fingers trembled as I set the glass down on the nearest table. I let Seth lead me away from the ball. A sudden heaviness settled over me. I felt like I'd made some sort of irrevocable choice. And maybe I had. Chapter 21 Let's do something stupid. I turned to Seth, oddly nervous. You want to do something stupid right now? Can't you think of a better time to do something stupid? I considered that. He kind of had a good point. Okay, I'm down with stupid. Good. He started off pulling me through the labyrinth. We rounded the council chambers and headed into the campus. Seth cut toward the dark and silent building I'd spent the majority of my waking time in. You want to train? He shook his head, jaw clenched. No, I don't want to train. Seth picked up his pace. I had no idea what he was up to, but I'd learned a while ago to just go with it. The door to the arena was unlocked. A wide grin broke out across his face when he spotted the double doors inside the dark corridor. You want to go swimming? I asked. Sure. It's like forty degrees outside. Seth pushed open the door. The smell of chlorine was everywhere. So, it's not forty degrees in here, is it? More like sixty. I pulled away from him and stepped to the edge of the pool. Glancing over my shoulder, I saw Seth kick off his shoes. He caught my eye and winked. You're ridiculous, I said, fighting a grin. So are you. He slipped off the dress jacket, dropping it on the cement. We are a lot alike, Alex. I started to deny it, but I stopped and actually thought about it instead of dismissing it. There was something about Seth that called to my wilder and, yes, stupider side. We were both reckless, a little wild and aggressive, and neither of us knew when to ever be quiet. I guess there were two types of people in the world, those who sat around a fire staring into the flames and those who started the fire. Seth and I started the fire, and then we danced around it. Was it so obvious back there? I asked quietly. Seth had been yanking his white shirt out of his pants, but he stopped and looked up. He appeared to be choosing his words. I don't know what goes on in your head, Alex. I can't read your thoughts. I just picked up on your emotions. Good to know. 
I second thought. He started unbuttoning his shirt. Anyway, I don't even need to be able to sense your emotions to know. I don't think you want to know what it looked like. No, I do. I shifted my weight to my other foot. These heels were killing me. Shaking his head, Seth sighed. You were staring at him like an ugly chick stares at the last cute guy at the bar when they make their last call. I choked on my laugh. Oh, wow. Thanks. He raised his hands in a helpless gesture, which looked so strange for him. I told you. Yeah. I pushed strands of hair off my neck. So I looked like an idiot to everyone? No, everyone saw a beautiful half-blood. That's all anyone saw. Seth glanced away, a wry smile on his face. Can I tell you something? I turned back to the pool. Sure. I prefer you without gloves. His breath stirred the tendrils of hair against my neck. I had no idea how he moved so quietly. Oh, I said, watching Seth as he moved to my side. Quietly, he peeled off one glove and then the other, tossing them both away from the water. His fingers slid around the scars before he dropped my arm, stepping back. My tags never seemed to bother him. I looked at him through my lashes. Better? Much. I glanced down at the beautiful gown. Lawden would be so upset if I ruined her dress. I turned slightly, catching my reflection in the windows of the pool room. It didn't look like me. I looked like a doll, a carbon copy of my mom. So much so that even Lucian had looked at me in a way that made me puke a little in my mouth. Had that been what Lawden wanted? To fashion me like her long-lost friend? Can you get silk wet? I asked. Seth made a funny noise behind me. I'd say probably not. That's a shame. I kicked off my shoes. My toes immediately sighed and thanked me. You really are going. I dove in. The water wasn't as heated as I'd thought and was a shock to my system, but after a few seconds I grew used to it. Staying underwater, I swam to the opposite side of the pool. The water immediately killed all of Lawden's hard work. Twisting around, I found Seth at the pool's edge. Amusement and satisfaction played out across on his face, which made him look sort of normal. So childish, Alex, you've ruined her dress. The vibrant red silk floated around me as I treaded water. I know, bad me. Very bad. He sounded more appreciative than chastising. Grinning, I sank underwater again and closed my eyes. Under the water, it was a quiet, blissful world. I didn't have to think, or worry, or love. I inched my way back up and caught Seth shrugging off his shirt. I saw maybe a second of his bare upper body before I hastily ducked underwater. It wasn't bad, all golden skin and hard muscles. Seeing his chest wasn't a big deal for crying out loud. On the night Seth stayed with me, he did so fully clothed. Thank the gods, but it was just weird. Seth was weird, I was weird, and I couldn't stay underwater all night. Using my legs, I pushed off the bottom of the pole. Seth had moved to the center of the room. His head was tipped back, arms stretched high in the air as he stood on the tips of his toes, completely at ease. Stop staring. I floated forward. I'm not staring. He chuckled. How's the water? Nice. His arms dropped to his sides. Do you remember the last thing I told you in training? I pushed through the water, coming to where he stood. You tell me a lot of stuff in training. Honestly, I don't pay attention. He snorted. You do wonders for my self-esteem. Rolling my eyes, I pushed off the cement wall and floated on my back. The dress streamed out around me as water glided over my skin. I feel like a mermaid. Seth ignored that. Tomorrow, when they ask you about what happened in Gatlinburg, only answer their questions. I sighed. I know. What do you guys think I'm going to say, that I love demons? Just don't elaborate on anything. Answer yes or no, and that is it. I'm not stupid, Seth. Seth arched a brow. I didn't say you were. I just know you tend to talk a lot. Oh, like you're one. 
Seth dove in, sending a wave of water crashing over me, and I lost my balance. I sank under, only to find him swimming toward me. Recognizing the wild grin plastered across his face, I pushed back, but he caught the edge of my dress. I smacked his hand away and resurfaced. He came up a few feet away, shaking his head, sending beads of water flying. I splashed him. You talk more than I do. He floated over to the side and swung one arm over the edge. Squinting through water and hair, he made a face at me. You look like a drowned monkey. What? I do not. I ran a hand over my hair, then under my eyes. Come to think of it, I probably had brutal raccoon eyes right now. Wait, do I? Seth nodded. Honestly, you look like a mess. This was a bad idea. What was I thinking? Shut up. You don't look so hot yourself. That wasn't entirely true. Seth looked rather nice soaked. The whole shirtless thing probably helped. A little bit. Not much. For some bizarre reason, I thought about the day the rune had appeared. His lips curved into a mad sort of grin as he placed his hand over the water. Watch this. I tried keeping the edges of my dress from floating all the way up. Watch what? The water under his hand spun, much like water going down a drain. Then it shot straight up in the air, reaching for the ceiling. The cone of water twisted in midair, arced, and then came down. I couldn't move back quickly enough. Water funneled around me, pulsating and drowning out everything. Then it froze. I couldn't see beyond the wall of still water. I tilted my head back and smiled. Being stuck in a Seth-made typhoon was strange, but also cool. Tentatively, I reached out and poked a finger through it. Wrong move. It all came crashing down. The weight of the water pushed me under, and when I came back up, an all-out water war ensued. We both were acting like two bored kids who'd snuck away from their parents, but this was fun. It didn't matter I was sorely outmatched in the water arena, and Seth seemed intent on drowning me. I wasn't thinking about Aiden or the council or anything. Laughing and swallowing way too much water, I backed off while Seth pushed clumps of blonde hair out of his eyes. You're such a girl, Seth. Do we need to take a grooming break? You need to give up. He reared back, sending his arm crashing against the surface of the water. You can't beat me ever at anything. Give it up. I swam back, slipped under, and resurfaced quickly. I don't give up, Seth. He inched closer. Well, we all have to learn how to someday. Besides me, I'm secure in my awesomeness. More like you're secure in your douchiness. You are such a goner. He shot across the water, and I dropped underneath. I aimed for his legs, thinking that if I could take them out, I could take him out. But it didn't quite go as planned. I got one arm around a leg and tugged. Seth retaliated by reaching down and tugging me back up to the surface. The moment my head broke through the water, I struggled and cursed. Unsurprisingly, a long, wet gown really hindered the use of one's legs. That's cheating, Alex. Seth planted both hands above my hips. You know what happens to cheaters. I tried prying his fingers from my waist. Don't you dare. He lifted me until over half of my body was out of the water. I stared down at his face. His smile went up a notch as I dangled above him. Cold up there, huh? Yeah, it kind of was. Stupid down there, huh? Seth's brows flew up. For one in such a precarious position, you sure don't know how to talk yourself out of it. That's because it's hard to reason with idiots. I gave him a cheeky grin. Why bother? Oh, is that how it is? Well, my little Napoleon in training. Have a nice flight. Seth, I swear I will. Using the air element, he launched me out of the water, cutting off my words. I went up and up another couple of feet, and back down in a mess of arms and red silk several feet away. Water went up my nose as I sank to the bottom of the pool. Breaking the surface, I immediately started yelling things only Seth could truly appreciate. A lot of four-letter words that rhymed with other four-letter words. This resulted in me flying back through the air again and again. Okay, okay, I gasped, hanging above him.
you're awesome. Um, and you're not a douche all the time. Wait, I stalled as my knees came out of the water. You're just a great person, Seth frowned. And that doesn't sound very sincere. My hands slipped off his. Okay, you're the best Apollyon there is. He tipped his head to the side and arched a brow. I'm the only Apollyon there is right now. I grinned. You're still the best. He sighed, but he lowered me back down. Now you really do look like a drowned monkey. Thanks. I started for the shallow end of the pool, but Seth pushed through the water like a damn fish. He circled one arm around my waist and flipped me back around. Where do you think you're going? I went to push against his chest, but remembered there was literally nothing between my hands and his skin. I opted for his shoulders, which turned out to be rather pointless. Don't throw me again. I'm not going to throw you. I considered that for a moment. Then I win the water war? No. Damn. Well, I guess you have to be better than me at something. Congratulations. I'm always better than you. I'm... Egotistical, I supplied helpfully. Narcissistic? He pressed forward, and I backed up, trying to keep as much space between us as possible. Not that it did any good in water. My legs floated everywhere I didn't want them to, like closer to him. I have some words for you, too. How about stubborn, impudent, he countered, slowly pushing on until my back hit the rough edge of the pole. Was impudent your word choice of the day? He put his finger on my lips. Well, yes, it is. I could even use it in a sentence, if you like. That won't be necessary. He removed his finger and planted his hands on either side of me, effectively caging me in. I looked up, and our eyes locked. An immediate level of awareness passed between us. It was powerful, almost like the charge that had shot through us when I touched his rune. Something I never planned on doing again. The atmosphere was no longer playful or light, and as the silence grew, so did the nervousness in the pit of my stomach. Seth had that look on his face, all intent and purpose-driven, and it was directed at me. He liked to flirt, liked to push the line between us, but this, this was different. I felt it inside me, waking up and stirring. Suddenly, I thought of the heaviness I'd felt leaving the ball. I think we should head back now. I'm cold, and it's getting late. Seth smiled. No. No. I'm not done being stupid yet. He leaned in. Strands of his wet hair brushed my forehead. Actually, there's a lot of stupid left in me. At once, I placed my hands against his chest to stop him. His skin felt incredibly warm for being above the water. I opened my mouth to respond, but found myself at a loss. A strange edginess swamped me. Somehow he managed to get closer, and I... I didn't push him away or move my hands. Seth seemed to read something in that, because his hand slipped away from the edge and fell to my waist. You know what? His breath was warm against my cheek. There are a lot of stupid things to do, but I really want to do the stupidest thing possible. What's that? I want to kiss you. My stomach hollowed. That is crazy. I'm not Elena or any other number of girls. I know. Maybe that's why I want to. I turned my head in the other direction, or at least I thought I did. That was what I planned, but for some reason my head went the direction I didn't want it to, toward him and his warm breath. You don't want to kiss me. But I do. His lips brushed against my cheek, sending shivers that had nothing to do with the cold air over me. My hands slipped from his chest, and I gripped the edge of the pool. No, you don't. Seth chuckled against my cheek. He slipped his fingers up my spine, curving his hand around the nape of my neck. Are you arguing with me over what I want? You're arguing with me. You're ridiculous. I felt him smile as his lips brushed over the line of my jaw, over the bros. It's such an annoying quality, yet strangely endearing. My heart was beating way too fast. Well, you're annoying too.
He laughed again and pulled me against his chest. My fingers lost their tenuous grip on reality, falling into the water. Why are we still talking? I rested my cheek against his shoulder and closed my eyes. This is your one chance to talk without me telling you to shut up, because we aren't doing anything else. Do you know how amusing I find you? He shifted, pressing my back into the pool edge. His hand left my waist, smoothed down over my hip and thigh. Jerking back, I grabbed for his hand. Too late, he hooked my leg around his. What are you doing? I hated how breathless my voice sounded, confused by the need burning through me. Do you know why I think you're so amusing? He slid the hand over my thigh. Why? Because I know how badly you want me to kiss you. Seth cupped my chin, tipping my head back with his other hand. That's not true. You lie. Why, I have no idea. He pressed his lips against my cheek, then against my throat, my shoulder. The hand on my leg slipped between my thighs. My blood pounded, sending my heart into a frenzy. I can feel what you're feeling, and I know you want me to kiss you. I grasped his arms. It's not... Not what? He lifted his head, brushing his nose against mine. I... Just let me kiss you. Gods, I needed him to kiss me. I needed him to keep doing what he was doing with his hands. But was any of this about the heart? Or even the body? Or was it just what existed in both of us? The connection, the bond, whatever it was, controlling what we wanted. It sang between us, tightening until it was all that existed. But what I felt with Aiden wasn't a product of a connection, and it didn't fade away because he didn't return my feelings. I didn't even question what it was. But this? I had to question everything. I opened my eyes. Is this real? Very real. He leaned back and brushed strands of wet hair off my face. I did want to kiss him, and I also wanted to wrap myself around him. The ache his hands created was almost too hard to deny. But as I stared at him and saw the runes slipping down his neck, slowly reaching toward where my hands rested against his skin, I had no idea if I could trust what I wanted. There was something between us that neither of us fully understood. We didn't know what the connection actually controlled, what it could make us want. His breath danced over my cheek, then my lips. Angel, just let me kiss you. With Aiden, with what I felt for him, there was nothing external or internal pulling me toward him except what I felt for him. It didn't matter that it was forbidden or that he didn't want me. Seth dropped his hands suddenly. I hit the edge, wincing as the cement scraped my skin. The mark of the Apollyon shifted over his chest, swirling and moving. You're thinking about Aiden? I bit my lip. Not in the way you think I am. He ran both his hands over his head. Then he pushed forward, suddenly right in my face. You know, I don't know which is worse, that I was stupid enough to want to kiss you, or the fact that you're still hung up on someone who doesn't even want you. I blanked. Wow, that's a little harsh. It's a truth, Alex. Even if he did profess his undying love for you, you can't have him. I whirled around and hauled myself out of the pool. Standing above him, water ran off the ruined dress. Just because I can't be with him doesn't change the way I feel. In an instant, he was out of the water. If you have this epic love for Aiden, why did you want to kiss me as badly as you did? I flushed hot with fury, the kind that only came from Seth, making a point I couldn't argue. I didn't kiss you, Seth. That should answer your question right there. You wanted to. Trust me, I know you did. He smiled that smug smile. You really wanted to. I don't know what I want, I yelled, my hands balling into fists at my sides. How do you know, Seth? How do you know it's not the damn connection between us instead of something real? The anger faded from Seth's eyes, replaced by surprise. You think it's just the connection? Do you really think that's all I feel for you? I laughed harshly. You say it yourself all the time. Anytime you do something nice for me, you say it's the connection forcing you to do so. Did you ever consider that I was joking? 
No, why would I? You said the connection would grow stronger between us, I said. That's why you want to kiss me. It's not real. I know why I want to kiss you, Alex, and it has nothing to do with either of us being Apollyons. And apparently it has nothing to do with your common sense, either. I narrowed my eyes. Oh, shut up. I'm done talking. I know exactly why. Seth stalked forward, backing me up until I hit the cement wall behind me, and he stood inches away. I can't believe I'd even have to spell it out for you. Shivering in the cool, damp air, I flattened my hands against the wall. You don't have to. You're the most frustrating person I know. I rolled my eyes. And that makes you want to kiss me? You're twisted. His eyes burned like liquid gold. Do you feel the connection between us right now? I frowned, searching for the telltale signs the connection was doing its thing. I didn't feel that swamping hate or edginess, so I was going to go with no. Not really, but I don't know what it feels. Seth grasped the sides of my face and brought my mouth to his. I froze, shocked that he'd actually kiss me after all of that. But he was... Soft, tentative, questioning kisses, as if he was doing this for the very first time, and I so knew that wasn't the case. I knew I should stop him, because allowing him to kiss me totally defeated the point of the argument we just had, but I found myself closing my eyes instead. His mouth was so warm and sweet, dizzying, actually. Then it deepened, stealing my breath and sending my heart racing. Kissing wasn't a big deal, so this kiss shouldn't be any different. But by the gods, I'd never been kissed like this before. I looped my arms around his neck, tangling my fingers in his hair, and then I was kissing him back. Kissing him with the same wild abandonment he dived into, and gods, I liked kissing Seth. He was really good at it. Seth nipped at my lower lip as he pulled back just enough that I could breathe. You can't tell me you didn't like that. He pressed his lips to mine again, soaking up my response. Oh, don't you dare tell me you didn't kiss me. I let my hands slide down to his chest. I knew if I opened my eyes, I'd see the marks. I don't know what that was. He chuckled and brushed his lips across mine. You have a choice, Alex. I opened my eyes then. The marks stretching across his face were faint, but I still had the insane desire to run my fingers along them. It took everything in me not to. I met his eyes. What choice? His hands dropped to my shoulders, then made their way to my waist. They fisted the soaked material, holding me still. You can choose to continue wasting away for something you can never have. I swallowed. Or... He smiled. You can choose not to. Seth, I... Look, I know you aren't over him. He said him like it was some kind of venereal disease. But I do know you like me. I'm not suggesting anything. Not asking for stupid little labels or promises. No expectations. I took a shallow breath. What are you suggesting? You choose to see what happens. Seth let go of my dress and stepped back, running his hands through his wet hair. Between us, you choose us. Choose us? I shivered and wrapped my arms around me. Choose between what? Aiden was completely off limits and Seth and I, even though we were stuck with one another, couldn't go a day without wanting to knock each other's heads off. This didn't seem like a great choice. Seth smiled faintly. Think about it, at least. He turned around and went back to where he'd left his clouds. I sagged against the wall and sighed. Seth had done some pretty nice things for me. He'd stayed with me after Caleb's death, defended me against the master. But then there was Aiden and all that I felt for him, and the way he'd looked at me tonight. But choosing Aiden meant choosing nothing. Choosing Seth meant submitting to a whacked-out fate. Or did it? My gaze fell to my hand. The rune on my palm shone an iridescent blue, as if it were pleased by Seth's suggestions. And his suggestion didn't sound so bad. No labels, no expectations, no feelings. And that was good, because my heart... My heart was somewhere else. 
Soon I'd be heading home to North Carolina, where there would be no Caleb, no halves who really wanted to be around me, and no more Aiden. But there would be Seth. I pushed off the wall. Seth had his back to me, head bent in concentration. What was I doing? I stopped a few feet behind him, my heart jumping in my throat. Seth? He turned sideways, fingers finishing the last of the buttons. Alex? I... I choose you, or whatever it is that you're saying. I flushed. Gods, I sounded stupid. I mean, I choose the whole seeing what... Seth's mouth cut my words off. His arms swept around me, dropping something warm and dry over my shoulders. I realized it was his suit jacket, but then I was thinking about how warm he felt. Before I knew it, I was gripping his shirt, arching against him, soaking up his warmth. Then I felt it waking up like some kind of slumbering giant, sending sparks of electricity over my skin. My palm itched, burned, really. I gasped against his lips. The kiss wasn't enough. I slid my hands under his shirt, over the hard expanse of his stomach. He jerked back, breathing heavy. A fleeting, satisfied look shot across his face, gone so quickly I couldn't be sure what I'd seen. Then he smiled, and I knew I couldn't have seen that calculated edge to his stare. The transformation that occurred was nothing short of amazing. You're not sleeping in that bed, in that terrible little room tonight. Chapter 22 I did sleep in my bed in that terrible room. And I did so alone. It had taken every ounce of my self-control to convince Seth that sharing the same bed wasn't a good idea, which was difficult mainly because my body had thought it was an awesome idea. Surprisingly, my brain had won that battle. I didn't know why I'd kissed Seth once, then twice. How oh, I didn't even know why I agreed to seeing what happens. The smart thing would have been to punch Seth and make a run for it. But I never did the smart thing. That was a beautiful dress. Lawden wore a slight, curious frown. I guess there were several ways to ruin silk, and I suppose a midnight swim would be one of the more daring ways to do so. Cringing and flushing, I ran my hands down the only pair of dress pants I owned. They were made of some thin black material, and they swallowed my feet, which sucked. Even after I destroyed Lawden's dress, she'd let me borrow some sexy black pumps that made me feel tall and clever. I'm really sorry about the dress. I glanced back at the double doors adorned with a golden eagle. I have some money saved up. I can pay for it. No, don't worry about it. She patted my shoulder. Although I am curious to what actually provoked you to leave the ball so quickly, and then go swimming. You left with your Seth. I'm assuming you went swimming with him. My cheeks flamed at the mention of Seth. If my Seth had been here to catch that, I'd never hear the end of it, but he wasn't allowed in the council building. He's not my Seth. Marcus and Lucian rounded the corner before Lawden could do more than give me a knowing smile. Oddly, I felt grateful to see them. Lucian floated up to me, clasping my cold hand in his. Or maybe his hand was so warm that mine felt chilled to the bone. Dear, you look so nervous. There is nothing to be worried about. The council will ask you a few questions, and that is all. I met Marcus's stare over Lucian's shoulder. He looked like there was something to be worried about. Sliding my hand free, I resisted the urge to wipe it across my pants. I'm not nervous. Lucian patted my shoulder as he slid around me. I must go in and take my seat. It's about to begin. It being the whole reason I'd come up here. Watching the council guards hold the doors for Lucian, I decided I wasn't nervous. I just wanted to get this over and done with. Marcus's lips were drawn tight when I faced him. Passing a meaningful look at Lawden, he waited until she nodded and followed Lucian into the council before he spoke. Alexandria, I expect you to be on your best behavior in there. Do not allow yourself to get drawn into any arguments. Only answer their questions, nothing more. Do you understand? My eyes narrowed as I crossed my arms. What do you all expect me to do? Go buck wild and start cussing people? Anything is possible, really. You're known for your temper, Alex. 
Some probably expect you to lose your cool, said a deep, familiar voice from behind me. Every cell of my skin recognized and still responded to that voice. It didn't matter that I'd chosen Seth last night. Wasn't that what I'd done? My brain screamed at my body to not turn around, but it didn't listen. Aiden looked every inch of pure blood. One lock of his otherwise tamed dark hair kept falling forward, brushing against thick, sooty lashes. Dressed in that white, mafia-style get-up, he appeared even more untouchable to me. Marcus cleared his throat, and I realized I was staring. Blushing fire engine red, I turned to Marcus. I know, just to answer their questions, blah blah. I got it. Marcus glared at me. I hope so. I didn't know how else to prove to them that I wasn't going to jump out of my chair and body slam someone. Marcus checked his watch. We must head in. Alexandria, the guards will call you when the council is ready. I won't go in with you all, I asked. He shook his head and disappeared into the council, which left Aiden and me alone with the silent guards. Ignoring him was out of the question. So, how have you been? Aiden stared somewhere over my head. Good. You? Good. He nodded and then glanced at the doors. The awkwardness of all of this pained me. You can go in. You don't have to wait out here. His gaze fell on me finally. I do have to go in. I nodded, biting the inside of my cheek. I know. Aiden started toward the door, but then stalled. Seconds went by before he pivoted back to me. Alex, you can do this. I know you can. Our eyes locked and I sucked in air. Speechless, I stood there as his gaze left mine and roamed over my face. I couldn't remember if I'd put on any makeup today. Maybe some lip gloss? My hair was under control, so it fell around my cheeks and covered my neck perfectly. I touched my lips, happy to find they felt glossy. His eyes zeroed in on my movements before he broke away, running a hand over his head. He let out a ragged sound, and when he spoke, his voice was so low that I barely heard him. I think I'll remember how you looked last night for the rest of my life. Gods, you were so beautiful. I may have stroked out. The next thing I knew, he disappeared beyond the heavy council doors. He left me spinning in confusion, hot, then cold, kind, and then standoffish. I didn't get it. Why tell me that, and then walk away? Like the day he'd said he wished Seth had killed the master for hitting me. Why admit any of that? Leaning against the wall, I let out a long, tired sigh. Now wasn't the time to obsess over Aiden's manic mood swings. I needed to focus on... The door to my left opened, revealing a council guard. Miss Andros, your presence has been requested. Well, that came sooner than I'd expected. I pushed off the wall and followed the guard into the council. It looked different from what I remembered. Granted, the only time I had seen it was from the top balcony, hidden from the pures below. Titanium trim graced the curved benches that filled the ground floor of the Colosseum. The symbols etched into the tiles were artfully done, nothing like the chicken scratches in the pathways back home. Things had to be bigger, better here. Those in attendance swiveled around in their seats as I made my way down the center aisle. Openly curious stares met mine. Others were not so curious, more like downright hostile and suspicious. Stealing myself, I focused on the raised dais ahead instead of the violent roiling in my stomach. The ministers sat like gods about to rain down some great and terrible divine justice. They watched my progress, picking apart everything about me before I'd even reached them. Only one didn't seem bothered by me. Reclining in one of the smaller thrones, dressed in lavish white robes, Lucian stared at Tully. Or perhaps he was staring at Tully's throne, imagining himself in the seat that offered the closest thing our world had to absolute power. An open chair faced the audience in front of the eight, directly between two thrones occupied by Headminister Telly and Diana Elders. I stared at the seat, unsure if I was supposed to wait until I was given the okay to sit or make myself at home. I sat. A hush of disapproval swept through the crowd of pures. Apparently that had been the wrong action. This was starting out great— Lifting my eyes, I glanced at the balcony and caught a shadow flickering back from the railing. 
Seth. I felt Telly rise behind me, but I didn't dare look. Somehow I knew that would also give rise to another murmur of censure. Casually, I rested my hands on the arms of the chair and stared out at the crowd in front of me. I searched out Aiden immediately. He was leaning forward in his seat, eyes fastened on the ministers behind me. Alexandria Andros. Headminister Tally drifted around my chair. He stopped beside me, tipping his head to the side. With an elegant wave toward the audience, he smiled broadly, making him look like a demented cherub past its prime. We must ask that you swear an oath to the consul, and to the gods that you will answer each question today with the utmost honesty. Do you understand? I nodded, eyeing the head minister. Was it just me, or did the gray clinging to the hair around his temples appear to be spreading? Breaking this oath would be an act of treason, not just against the consul, but also the gods. Doing so would result in your removal from the covenant. This is also understood, I assume. Yes. Then do you, Alexandria Andros, swear to disclose all information regarding the events that took place in Gatlinburg? I met Telly's pale eyes. Yes. His smile turned brittle as he held my gaze. Good. How have you found your accommodations here, Alexandria? Have they been to your liking? Telly tisked softly. Look only at me, Alexandria. The arms of the chair groaned as my fingers dug into the wood. Everything has been lovely. One dark brow arched as he glided to the other side of my chair. What pleases me to hear? Alexandria, why did your mother leave the Covenant three years ago? I blinked tightly. What does that have to do with what happened in Gatlinburg? You've been asked a question. No, do not look out to the audience. Why did your mother leave the Covenant three years ago? I... I don't know why. I kept my eyes on Tully this time. She never told me. Tully glanced at the audience while he rubbed his thumb and index finger together. You do not know. No, I heard myself say, staring at his hand. That is not true, Alexandria. You know why your mother left the Covenant. Jerking my eyes away from his hand, I shook my head. My mother never told me why. All I know is what other people have said. What were those reasons? Where was he going with this? I followed his slow, purposeful movements. He was circling me. She left because the Oracle told her I would become the next Apollyon. Why would that make her leave? I couldn't help it. My gaze moved to the balcony, to where I knew Seth watched. Alexandra, do not look away, he snapped. Now I understood why Marcus had looked so worried. My entire body thrummed with a desire to plant my foot into Telly's gut. I glared at him. She wanted to protect me. A different minister spoke next. The older, pure woman's voice rubbed like sandpaper over my skin. From whom would she have wanted to protect you? Was I supposed to continue looking at Telly or the minister? I don't know. Maybe she was worried about the gods getting upset over there being two of us. That would be a concern, she responded. There should not be two of you in the same generation. What other reasons would there be? asked Telly. Words tumbled out of my mouth. Not good or smart ones. Maybe she was afraid of what the council would do. Telly stiffened. That is absurd, Alexandria. It's what she said. Really? His brows rose. I thought she never told you why she pulled you from the Covenant. Damn it. I could imagine the look on Aiden's and Marcus's faces. She never told me why before she was... before she changed. But she told you after she chose to become a demon? asked a male minister. My mother didn't choose to become a demon. I gripped the arms of the chair again, drawing in several deep breaths. She was forced to become one... And yes, she told me that I wouldn't have lived if I'd stayed at the Covenant. What else did she tell you about why she left? asked Tally. That was it. Why did you never report her during the three years you were missing? She was my mom. I was afraid she would be punished. Rightfully so, said the elder minister. What she did was unforgivable. From the moment she was told of your true nature, it was her duty to tell the council. 
That is true, Minister Mola. Telly paused, placing a hand on the back of my chair. How is it that you did not know your mother had turned? Air couldn't fill my lungs quick enough. I found her, and I thought she was dead. I killed the demon that was hurting her. Then what happened? Telly asked so softly, I felt sure no one else could hear him. My throat burned. There was another demon, and I... I ran. You run, repeated Telly, loud enough for the entire council to hear. I thought she was dead. I swallowed, my gaze falling to the floor. I was trying to get back to the covenant. So it took the perceived death of your mother for you to remember your duty to the covenant? Telly didn't wait for me to answer, which was a good thing. I had no answer for that. You were found in Atlanta, with four demons, is that not correct? What did any of this have to do with what had happened in Gatlinburg? They were following me. It wasn't like I was hanging out with them. Your tone is one of disrespect, snapped the elder minister. It would do you well to remember your position, half-blood. I bit down on my lip until I tasted blood. Telly drifted to the right of me. Were you aware of your mother's whereabouts after you returned to the Covenant, Alexandria? A fine trickle of sweat traced down my spine. No. But you left the Covenant in August to find her, did you not? After she took part in a Lake Lure massacre. And you did find her. Telly's full lips twisted cruelly. Telly had tripped me up again. I closed my eyes and inhaled. I didn't know where she was. I didn't even know she was alive until Lucian told me. Ah, yes. He glanced behind me at Lucian. What did you do once you found out she was alive? Punched and kissed a pure blood, but I doubted he wanted to know that. Actually, he'd love to know that. He'd use it to send me to the masters within the hour. Nothing. Tully clucked his tongue. Bald. Anger pulsed through me, pounding in my temples. What do these questions have to do with what my mother told me the demons were planning? They want to overtake the council, turn halves, and send them back to the covenants to kill. Isn't that more important? Surprisingly, Telly handled my temporary loss of sanity well. It has everything to do with it, Alexandria. What provoked you to leave the covenant and search for your mother? The need to lie was almost too great. When I realized she'd killed at Lake Lore, I left. I figured she'd find me, and she did. I felt like she was my responsibility, my problem. Interesting. Telly roamed to the edge of the dais. Looking out over the audience, he spoke louder. Is it true you did not fight Rachel when you saw her in Bald Head? I glared at the back of Telly's head. Yes. He cocked his head to the side. Why? I froze. She was my mother. Half blood see through the elemental magic. We cannot. How could you see past the monster she'd become? He pivoted around, smiling at me. This is what we do not understand, Alexandria. You left Florida, claiming that you believed she was dead. You came back to the Covenant, and your mother followed you, leaving behind a trail of slaughtered purebloods and guards. What? There was only the attack at Lake Lure. She didn't... You've been sadly misled. His smile grew wider, truer. She was responsible for over twenty attacks across the southeastern coast. We were able to track her progress right to the doorsteps of the North Carolina Covenant. She sent the demon half-blood back to the Covenant. Was that to draw you out? Twenty attacks? No one had told me that. Not Aiden, Marcus, nor even Seth. They had to have known. Why wouldn't they have told me that? Alexandria. I lifted my eyes. Yes, I guess she wanted to draw me out. It worked. You left the day after Cain Boros had returned and murdered several pure bloods. Telly strode across the dais. Tell me, Alexandria, a half-blood named Caleb Niccolo was also with you in Gatlinburg. My chest clenched. Yes. Telly nodded. Did he try to stop you in Bald Head? Yes. Is this the same half-blood who died a few weeks ago? Asked a female minister. In a demon attack while he was with this one.
I believe so, Telly answered. How convenient, the minister murmured, but it sounded like he had screamed those words. While you were in Gatlinburg with Rachel, what did she tell you the demons planned to do? Somewhat sick to my stomach, I told the council what Mom had planned. Remembering my instructions, I didn't tell them it was actually Eric who elaborated on the whole thing. Nothing crossed Telly's face as he watched me. Honestly, I don't even think he cared about what I was saying. They plan to attack the council and bring us down, the old minister snorted. This is ridiculous, all of this. Telly chuckled then. It is to think that a bunch of addicts could form a cohesive plan. Addicts? Yes, they are addicted to ether, but they are the most dangerous kind of addict, said Minister Diana Elders, speaking for the first time. We cannot dismiss what they are capable of. Knowing they can turn half-bloods changes things, and obviously the gods are questioning our ability to rein the demons back in. This started a battle of wills for the next several minutes. A few ministers didn't like the idea of ignoring the demons' plans, while the others simply didn't take the threat seriously. Suggestions were thrown around, like increasing the number of sentinels and sending them out to target large infestations of demons, but the majority of ministers didn't see any reason to do so. The talks kept coming back to me. My stomach filled with dread as understanding dawned. Telly and much of the council outright dismissed the demons' plans. Suddenly, I knew what my mother had told me was not the whole reason why I'd been ordered to attend the session. Marcus had been sadly misled, or maybe he'd known all along. Distracted by the other ministers, I was able to look out over the crowd without Telly bitching me out. Aiden whispered to Marcus, his hands tight and white-knuckled on the back of the bench in front of him. I looked up at the balcony. I could only imagine what Seth thought of all this. Tully finally returned his attention to me. Rachel planned on turning you into a demon. I wanted to say, no shit, but I decided against it. Yes. Tully turned his hawkish nose into the air. Why? I rubbed my hand over my forehead. She wanted me to become the Apollyon as a demon. She thought she'd be able to control me then. So she wanted to use you, asked Tully. To do what? She wanted to make sure I didn't come after her, I guess. What would you do for her? I met Tully's stare. Somehow I think he already knew this part. She wanted me to take out the other Apollyon, and she wanted me to help the demons with their plans. Oh, yes, their plans to take out the council and enslave the purebloods. Tully shook his head, smiling. How many times were you tagged, Alexandria? My entire body tensed. I don't know. A lot? He appeared to consider this. Enough to be turned, you think? Nightmares of those hours locked away with Daniel and Eric haunted me still. I remember that last tag, the one I'd felt sure would finally darken my soul, shatter it into nothing. One more tag, and I would have crossed over to the dark side. A fine sheen of cold sweat broke out across my forehead. Alexandria. I blinked, bringing his face back into focus. Almost enough. Did you try to stop them? Trained or not, you'd already killed two demons by then. Disbelief coated the back of my throat. Tagging is very painful, Telly continued, stopping beside me for what felt like the hundredth time. His face seemed fuller when he stood close. How could you allow that to happen repeatedly? It seems that a half-blood would do everything and anything to prevent from being tagged. I couldn't fight them. His dark brows rose in incredulity. You couldn't or wouldn't. I closed my eyes, struggling with patience. I promised her I wouldn't if she didn't kill Caleb. I had no other choice. There are always choices, Alexandria. He paused, disgust curling his lip as he stared down at me. To allow something so revolting seems suspicious. Perhaps you wanted to be turned. Head minister, Lucian spoke up then. I understand that some of these questions are necessary, but Alexandria did not submit to those atrocities willingly. To even suggest something like that seems unnatural and cruel. Is that so? Telly sneered at me. 
Wait a second, I said, his words finally sinking in. Are you suggesting that I wanted to be turned into something that evil? That I asked for it? Tully raised his hands haughtily. How do you think we'd interpret it? I looked at the audience then, briefly catching a pained look on Marcus's face. Do you know that sounds like a rapist's motto? She wore a short skirt, therefore she wanted it. Several gasps could be heard from the audience. It seemed the word rapist was unseemly. The smug look slowly slipped from Tully's face. Alexandria, you're out of line. My brain clicked off at that point. What Daniel had said to me before he tagged me filled my mind. It was like Tully thought the same thing, that I wanted to be tagged, that I enjoyed it. I stood. You're telling me I'm out of line? No one gave you leave. Tully drew himself up to his full height. Oh, I'm not leaving. All eyes were on me. I reached down and pulled my sweater up and over my head. There was a moment when no one seemed to breathe. I met the open-mouthed stares. I'd think I didn't have a camisole on underneath the sweater by the looks on their faces. What in the world are you doing, Alexandria? demanded Lucian. Ignoring him, I stepped away from the chair and held my arms out in front of me. Does this look like something I wanted to go along with, that I asked for this? Against their will, dozens and dozens of eyes fastened on my arms. Most gasped and shuddered, looking away quickly. Others didn't, as if they couldn't tear their eyes from the patchy red skin and its unnatural shine. My gaze flitted across the floor as Telly looked like he was having a heart attack beside me. I saw the proud tilt to Laudan's chin. A few rows in front of her, I saw Dawn's horrified gaze. Further back, behind the council members, Marcus paled. It kind of hit me that he'd never seen my scars, only caught glimpses of the ones on my neck. I don't think he'd known how bad they were. I felt a hot flush crawl up my neck, but the stunned look of pride on Aiden's face gave me the confidence to face the ministers. I wondered what Seth's expression looked like. He was probably smiling. He loved it when I was irrational, and this was really irrational. Twisting around, I showed them my arms. They look like they hurt, don't they? They did. It's the worst kind of pain you can imagine. Alexandria, sit down. We get your point. Telly reached for me, but I stepped aside. A guard moved in, picking up my sweater. He held it, his eyes nervously bouncing between Telly and me. I glanced at the other guards, hoping they weren't planning on body slamming me to the ground. All but one were half-bloods, and none of them seemed willing to stop me. Tipping my head at the ministers, I tried to keep the smile off my face. So do you really think I went along with my mother, that I wanted this? Diana paled and looked away, shaking her head sadly. The remaining ministers reacted much like the audience had. Either way, I'm pretty sure I'd gotten my point across. A furious shade of red covered Tully's cheeks. Are you done, Alexandria? I met his scowl with my own. Leisurely, I went back to my chair and sat down. I guess so. Tully ripped the sweater out of the guard's hand. I could tell he wanted to throw it at me, but with amazing self-control, he handed it over. I didn't put it back on. No, where were we? We were at the point where you were accusing me of wanting to become a demon. Several ministers inhaled sharply. Telly looked seconds away from exploding. Leaning down so that our faces were inches apart, he spoke low and quick. You are an unnatural thing, do you understand me? A harbinger of death to our kind and to our gods, the both of you. I shrunk back, wide-eyed. Harbinger of death sounded extreme and crazy. Head minister, called Lucian. We cannot hear your question. Would you care to speak again? Telly straightened. I asked her if there was anything more she would like to add. My jaw hit the floor. He smiled evenly. There are areas besides the event in Gothenburg that concern me greatly, Alexandria. Your behavior before you left the Covenants and the fighting you've taken part in upon your return have served you a great disadvantage, I'm afraid. And how is it that the night the Covenant was breached in North Carolina, you were outside your dorm after the curfew implemented for half-bloods? I so knew where this was going, so I cut to the chase. 
I didn't let the demons in, if that is what you're suggesting. Telly's smile turned sour. So it appears. Then there is your behavior since you arrived here. You accused the pure blood of using a compulsion against you, did you not? She did what? screeched the old female minister. To accuse a pure blood of such an act is shocking. Was there any proof, Minister Telly? My guards could not find anything to support the claim. Tully paused dramatically. And then you attacked a master who was disciplining a servant. Several ministers lost it then. Tully preened as they demanded to know exactly what occurred. I pictured rushing across the dais and kicking Tully in the groin over and over again. When it calmed down a bit, Tully addressed the council. His voice rang loud through the Colosseum. I fear that we have a greater concern than demons pulling together and attacking us in droves. What you see sitting before us may look like an ordinary half-blood, but we all know that is not the case. In a matter of a few months, she will become the second Napoleon. If she is even half as uncontrollable as she is now, what do you think will occur when she awakens? My heart stuttered, missing a beat. As the head minister, it pains me 